Earlier this year, my wife took a case to the High Court of New Zealand, attempting to secure about a choice about how and when she would die. She sought a ruling that assisted dying would not be a prosecutable offence, or if it was, then that would be an infringement of her human rights. Today I'm going to be talking about the results of that case, but first I want to talk a little bit about who Lucretia was and why this choice was so important to her. I met Lucretia in 2003 at a Wellington bar called Hummingbird. Uh, for me, it was love at first sight. Lucretia was extraordinarily beautiful, and I was instantly drawn to her. On subsequent dates, I found out that she was an exceptional person, kind, generous, and fearsomely intelligent. She also had the best laugh in the world, and that's the thing that I miss most about her. I adored her, and so did most people that met her. She was born in Tauranga in uh, 1973. Her parents were in their early 20s, uh, and they came from working-class families. They struggled to get by, but they were good people. Lucretia excelled at school and enjoyed cooking and dancing and loved art subjects. At a young age, she decided that she wanted to be a lawyer. So when she finished high school, she uh, enrolled at Victoria University of Wellington and, uh, to, to study law. She was a bright and popular student, and she was drawn to uh, public law and constitutional law, so how our laws get made, human rights, and our parliamentary processes. The law for Lucretia was something that upheld the good in society. It was something that represented our shared values. It was in service to us. It allowed us to live our lives as we wished, with dignity and respect. It wasn't something that was beyond question. It evolves as we evolve. It is compassionate. It trusts us to live our lives as we wish, but holds us to account where we fall short of expectations. It should not be used to empower privileged groups to entrench their beliefs and fears and prejudices. Instead, it should, it, it should be used to um, not, not let those privileged groups, I guess, subjugate others or restrict their rights. Lucretia supported things like homosexual law reform, gay marriage, women and disability rights. She believed in equality, fairness, justice, and love. We married in 2006, and I thought I was the luckiest guy alive. I like to think that we married as partners, as, as equals. Like many of our generation, we, we were rejected traditional marital roles. Um, but during our marriage, you know, there were times when I wouldn't work or she wouldn't work, and we supported one another. We would share the household responsibilities, and I'd often cook badly. <laughs> um, but we supported each other to be the best people that we could possibly be without trying to um, shape each other into the traditional marital archetypes that our parents' generation are more familiar with. We wanted children, and we struggled, we struggled with infertility. Um, despite our best efforts, we couldn't conceive. Um, Lucretia was slightly older than me, and 34 at the time when we began trying, and she had some issues that couldn't be overcome via medical assistance. Uh, it, bro it broke our hearts. Uh, we had two miscarriages. The lowest point, I think, was at a, a, a private hospital in Wellington where a consultant was looking for a heartbeat for an embryo at 12 weeks and couldn't find one. The other day, I was looking through Lucretia's papers and I found a photo of a blastocyst that she'd, she'd kept uh, and written a date on in biro. Um, she never let go of the hope that she would conceive with me someday. We looked at donors, um, and we, we fell in love with a woman from San Diego and uh, thought that she might be able to help us. So she consented to help us, and we were hours away from booking our trip to San Diego to start this new chapter of our lives, to have this family. But after complaining about headaches and vision issues to her doctor over a few weeks, she finally got an appointment with a neurologist and we agreed to wait until we saw this neurologist before we booked our flights. The neurologist examined Lucretia, and they were worried. Uh, he scheduled urgent scans, and he wrote on the referral, abnormality expected. We had the scans the next day, and Lucretia had advanced or, uh, severe brain cancer, um, something called a diffuse astrocytoma, which covered a full quarter of her brain. She was at risk of going into a coma within weeks 
if uh, it, w it wasn't treated. So we never made it to San Diego. Lucretia entered surgery uh, within a week uh, with the risk that she wouldn't come out of that. I remember standing beside her bed uh, before it was wheeled into the operating theatre wondering if I'd ever see her again. Thankfully, the surgery was successful and she emerged uh, with her skull shaved and um, her head sort of stitched back up and uh, all bandaged, etc. Um, but as, even though she was broken apart and put back together and forever changed by that experience, she was still my beautiful and brave wife and the woman I loved and would always love. Lucretia recovered from her surgery and she received radiotherapy, um, which uh, took the rest of her hair and burned her scalp. This helped for a while, uh, two years in fact, and we started talking about having kids again. She wore wigs and hats and went back to work. She had vision issues and she couldn't drive, but she could deal with that. She was well enough uh, for us to go to Rarotonga at the end of that first year, and we loved it. We um, hired a, sky a scooter and drove around the islands and we lazed on the beaches and we had fun. I remember um, seeing her lazing in an Ataki lagoon, just totally blissed out. And I don't think I've ever seen her that happy. She, Lucretia wasn't going to let the cancer slow her down or depress her. She loved her life, and she wanted to get the most out of it that she possibly could, even with that diagnosis. In 2013, we went to Argentina. We saw the Iguazu Falls, and we tangoed in Buenos Aires. Um, but it wasn't long before we could see that Lucretia was starting to regress again. She was losing movement on her left-hand side, and uh, she needed to use a walking stick to get around. She began chemotherapy, and that improved things a little bit, but in 2014, the drugs stopped working. We fell back on secondary chemo chemotherapy treatments, um, but they didn't work. People suggested various alternative therapies, but they didn't really help. Lucretia's decline was now ineluctable. She began to accept that her time was limited. She still held out hope of um, going to her mother's 60th birthday party and our 10th wedding anniversary. That would have been in April 2016, next year. She was committed to her life and extending it as long as possible. But I think she began to accept that the cancer was going to ultimately defeat her. Lucretia was confronted with her mortality. So Lucretia, a life without quality, it was not a life that she was interested in living. And when my wife looked at how things would sort of potentially play out for her, she was pretty scared and horrified. And she wanted to be conscious and she wanted to be lucid. She wanted to be able to say goodbye to her loved ones and then just to quickly slip away with medical assistance if possible, not to linger on half alive, semi-conscious. The death she wanted, the death she wanted would have given her some control, she felt, and it was important to her to have it. And it's a death that I think you know, a lot of us would want to have if we were in that situation. Unfortunately, the death that my wife wanted was um, not allowed under New Zealand law. Lucretia, oh, when medicine fails, and it, all, it fails all of us, eventually. Uh, we're sort of left on our own a little bit. But we, 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 we can take up something called palliative care. The aim of palliative care is not to um, cure you, but to deal with the symptoms that you have and make your death or your last days comfortable. It's a, it's a noble profession. But like medicine, palliative care is not a panacea. Like medicine, palliative care is imperfect and sometimes it fails too. Some of us will have conditions or circumstances where palliative care can't help us. I read an American Cancer Society report that uh, said essentially that 10% of cancer patients will have some form of symptom that can't be dealt with by palliative medicine. Lucretia was at risk of something called coning. This was where her brain would swell and push down into her brain stem causing her extreme pain that wouldn't be able to be managed by morphine or steroids. She was at risk of pure agony. This wasn't speculation, this, is, this was the professional medical advice that, that we received. Not only that, 
she was also going to lose her mental faculties, uh, her, her um, control over her body, bodily functions, um, her sense of who she was, and all of this was an unbearable thought to her. In the face of all of this, the limitations of palliative care, the loss of consciousness, the possibility of being in extreme pain, and the fact that she would probably have to live a death that was completely at odds with the way she had lived her life, she sought some control over the situation. Now, she didn't want to die. <laughs> if she'd had the choice to cast off the cancer that was killing her, she would have chosen that. But she didn't have that choice. Instead, she accepted that the cancer was going to kill her, and she sought a choice about how and when that would happen. The choice Lucretia wanted was not supported by the law. And she asked a simple question, why? Why shouldn't she have some control over how she would die? To find out an answer to that question, she took a case to the High Court of New Zealand. And after a three-day hearing, over which she could only attend parts, uh, the court responded that, well, basically, it's because the law says so. The judge accepted that what Lucretia was asking for was a reasonable and rational response to her circumstances. It made sense. But his view was that he couldn't read the law to allow uh, assisted dying without prosecution, and that as a member of the judi judiciary, he wasn't in a position to do anything about it. It was Parliament's job. In going to the courts, Lucretia didn't want to shorten her life, she wanted to extend it. Like many in her situation, she faced a cruel dilemma, take her own life, alone, violently, horribly, or face the possibility of a long, drawn-out death of which she had no control over. But perhaps most cruelly was the psychological tension that came with that. Which does she choose? If the law were more permissive, she could have looked at her condition day by day and made a decision, you know, when would have been the right time to go for her. She wouldn't be forced to take the gamble that things might not work out, things might be unbearable, intolerable. Under New Zealand law, a lonely, secretive suicide is the only way to opt out of that gamble. I read a lot about this. An estimated 5 to 8% of all New Zealand suicides annually are people in situations like Lucretia's, facing a terminal illness, and they kill themselves to escape the possibility that they might suffer a death that they, they don't want to suffer. There are cases on record of people killing themselves with shotguns or driving their mobility scooter off a cliff in order to avoid succumbing to a death that's out of their control. These people with assisted dying legislation might have lived longer, might have had a more comfortable, more agreeable death than the one that they had if that legislation was in place. In 2013, New Zealand coroner Ian Smith asked Parliament to look at assisted dying again after he dealt with the case of an 83-year-old woman who suffocated herself at home with a homemade contraption. In his view, the coroner felt that it's hard to classify these cases as suicide because these people were going to die anyway from the illness that they had, and these people were merely taking control over how that happened. Is that really suicide? I read Atul Gawande's book, uh, Being Mortal, where he talks about extending life, uh, or medicine extending life at the expense of quality of life, uh, and often against the patient's wishes. He argues for end-of-life care that respects the patient, that rejects the paternalism of doctor knows best, or the doctor can always fix things, and instead puts the patient at the centre of the conversation. What do they want? He's not a campaigner for assisted dying, but I, I think his patient-centric view applies equally as it does for, to life as it does to death. We should do our best to respect patients. It is wrong for the health system to push us towards a certain death if there's another option that causes, causes no harm to others and causes less harm and suffering to us. My wife, Lucretia, was condemned to death by cancer. Make no mistake, the cancer was always going to kill her. From the very first diagnosis, the prognostic indicators were bad. Though Lucretia never lost hope, she also never lost her sense of perspective. She saw her diagnosis as an opportunity not to give in or give up, but to get the most value out of her life that she possibly could. 
She loved her life. She wasn't about to let cancer change that. My wife believed that whether she died through assisted dying or taking her own life or uh, withdrawal of treatment or starvation, the thing that was killing her was the cancer, nothing else. All my wife saw was a little control over that cancer, to be able to say, you might have taken my life, but I'm going to choose my death. Unfortunately, the current law in New Zealand suggests that Lucretia's body and life is owned by something other than her, a patriarchal and paternal system that restricts the freedoms and autonomy of individuals. To suggest that Lucretia or people like her don't know their own mind or don't want what they say they want, I think is a shameful thing to suggest. The judge in Lucretia's case agreed. Although Lucretia did not get the ruling that she sought, she still made a difference. By taking her private life and her illness public and taking the court case that she did, she brought her sister dying back into the public conversation. After years of inaction as various assisted dying bills languished in the parliamentary ballot, we finally had politicians engaging with the issue again. When a voluntary euthanasia society petition was presented to Parliament a few, month, a few weeks after my wife's death, the Health Select Committee agreed to look into the issue. We have never had a select committee in New Zealand look into the issue of assisted dying before. This is a huge win. It's incredibly important that the public, the enlightened public, engages with this process and forces the politicians to make a change. Most of us won't have the death that we want. Most of us, I think, would like to die at home surrounded by our loved ones. But less than a third of us will have that. Based on a 2011 uh, palliative care report, most people will die in a hospital or in a residential care facility, places where people may not be trained sufficiently in palliative care. I'm really grateful that Lucretia got to die at home, surrounded by her family. Lucretia's death was not prolonged, but it was not without suffering. And in not having the choice that she wanted, she, endured several, she, she had several months of psychological torment, wondering how things were going to play out. People have said to me, Everything happens for a reason, and I hate that. <laughs> I hate the idea that my wife, there was some reason my wife was taken from me and, and uh, died as young as she did. I believe that at the center of everything there's chaos and chance, and there are things like cancer which are basically the black shadow cast by indifferent cosmic dice. Our job is to kind of make sense of it, to create meaning, I guess, or to create a story about everything the universe throws at us. My wife, facing her death as bravely as she did, crafted an end to her story which no one could fail to be proud of. And I'm going to continue telling that story for as long as people listen and as long as people want to listen. And that way, I'm going to make sure that she's remembered. And I want, I will ensure that her, her resolve, her courage and her strength weighs heavily on the consciences of our elected politicians until they change the law, because they must change the law. All of us will face death one day. We don't know when or how it will happen. And, but there's the real possibility that we may find ourselves in a situation where a physical body sustains us beyond what, uh, uh, sustains us beyond our tolerance, our levels of tolerance and endurance. And if the closed-minded have their way, we'll just have to put up with that. But there is another option, a more compassionate option to have a chance to say goodbye to your, your goodbyes to your loved ones, to hold, your hand, hold their hands before you go. And this is the option that she was fighting for, it's the option that I'm fighting for, and it's the option that I hope that you will consider fighting for. May the law respond to public pressure and a new climate of compassion and understanding, and evolve to honour and listen to patients and their wants and respect them. And when your time comes, may you die well and have your wishes, whatever they are, respected. Thank you. <laughs>